Freedom is a two-edged sword. Preface. Since I first wrote this essay in 1946, some of my most ominous predictions have been all too grimly fulfilled. Public employees have been subjected to the ignominy and indignity of loyalty oaths and so-called loyalty purges. Members of the United States Senate, moving under the cloak of so-called immunity and the excuse of emergency, have made a joke of justice and a mockery of privacy. Constitutional immunity and legal procedure have been consistently violated, and that which once, not so long ago, would have been a universal outrage in America, is today refused even review by the Supreme Court. The golden voice of social security of socialized this and socialized that with its attendant conf confiscatory taxation and intrusion on individual liberty is everywhere raised and everywhere heated. England has entered the agus of a regime synonymous with total regimentation. Austria, Hungary, Yugoslavia, and Czechoslovakia have fallen victims to communism, and the United States is in the process of making deals with the barbarous and corrupt dictatorships of Argentina and Spain. As I write, the United States Senate is pursuing a burlesque investigation into the sphere of private sexual morals, which, for all its buffoonery, will cause pain and sorrow to many innocent persons in an intolerable and grotesque invasion of their rights. The inertia and acquiescence which allows the almost complete suspension of our liberties would once have been unthinkable. The present ignorance and indifference is appalling and almost unbelievable. That little which is worthwhile in civilization and culture is made impossible. That little which is worthwhile in civilization and culture is made possible by the few who are capable of creative thinking and independent action, with the grudging assistance of the, the rest. When the majority of men surrender their freedom, barbarism is near. When the minority surrender it, we are the Dark Ages. Even the word liberalism is suspect through the unmitigated effort of fuzzy heads who believe it synonymous with Russian bootlicking and humanism. And humanism is no more than a front for the totalism of the church. Science that was going to save the world back in H.G. Wells' time is regimented, straight-jacketed, si sacred shitless, its universal language diminished to one word, security. In this 1950 view, some of my more hopeful utterances may appear almost naive. However, I was never so naive as to believe that freedom, in any full sense of the word, is possible to more than a few. But I have believed and do believe that these few, by self-sacrifice, by wisdom, by courage, by continuous and tremendous effort, can achieve and maintain a free world. The labor is heroic, but it can be done. By example and by education, it can be achieved. This is the faith that built America. This is the faith that America has surrendered. And this is the faith that I call on America to renew or perish. We are one nation and one world. The soul of the slums looks out of the eyes of Wall Street, and the fate of a Chinese coolie determines the destiny of America. We cannot suppress our brother's liberty without murdering ourselves. We will stand together as men for human freedom and human dignity, or we will fall together, simians all, back to the swamp. In this late, this very late hour, it is with solutions that we must be primarily concerned. I seem to be living in a nation that simply does not know what freedom is. We believe that it is a word, a piece of paper, something we're told that we have, that we tell each other we have. Indeed, it is more, far more than that. It is to that object, to the definition of freedom, to its understanding, in order that it may be seen and defended, that this essay is devoted. I need not add that freedom is a dangerous thing, but it is hardly possible that we are all cowards. For numberless centuries, society unquestioningly accepted the proposition that certain men were created to be slaves, whose natural function was to serve priests and kings, nobles and great lords, men of substance and property that were appointed slave masters by Almighty God. 
Further, this system was reinforced by the established doctrines that all men and women were owned, their minds by the church, their bodies by the state. This convenient situation was supported by a considerable body of authority, morals, religion, and philosophy. Against this doctrine, some 200 years ago, was openly raised the most astonishing heresy the world had ever known. The principle of liberalism. In essence, this principle stated that all men were created equal and endowed with inalienable rights. The words inalienable rights mean rights which cannot be taken away, which belong to man as his birthright. This principle appealed to certain intractable spirits, heretics, atheists, and revolutionaries, and has since, in spite of the opposition of the majority of organized society, made some headway. As a doctrine, it has become so popular that it is rendered lip service by all the major states. But it is still so distasteful to persons in authority and seeking authority that it is nowhere embodied as a fundamental law and is continuously violated in letter and in spirit by every trick and expedient of bigotry and reaction. Further, absolutist and totalitarian groups of the most vicious nature use liberalism as a cloak under which they move to reestablish tyrannies and extinguish the liberty of all opponents. Thus, religious groups seek to abrogate freedom of art, speech, and press. Reactionaries move to suppress labor and communists to establish dictatorships, all in the name of freedom. Excuse me. Thus, because of the peculiar distinctions given to freedom by some of these camouflaged tyrants, it seems necessary to redefine freedom in terms in which it was understood by that depraved cynic Voltaire, the dirty atheist Paine, the traitor Washington, the radical revolutionary Jefferson, and the anarchist Emerson. Freedom is a two-edged sword, of which one edge is liberty and the other responsibility, on which both edges are exceedingly sharp and which is not easily handled by casual, cowardly, or treacherous hands, for it has been sharpened by many conflicts, tempered in many fires, quenched by much blood, and although it is always ready for the use of the courageous and high-hearted, it will not remain when the spirit that forged it is gone. Now, since all tyrannies are based on dogmas, that is, on fundamental statements of absolute fact, and since all dogmas are based on lies, it behooves us first to seek for truth, and freedom will not be far away. And the truth is that we know nothing. Objectively, we know nothing at all. Any system of intellectual thought, whether it be science, logic, freedom, excuse me, any, any system of intellectual thought, whether it be science, logic, religion, or philosophy, is based on certain fundamental ideas or axioms which are assumed, but which cannot be proved. This is the grave of all positivism. We assume, but we do not know, that there is a real and objective world outside our own mind. Ultimately, we do not know what we are or what the world is. Further, if there is a real world apart from ourselves, we cannot know what that is. All we know is what we perceive it to be. All that we perceive is conveyed by our senses and interpreted by our brain. And however fine, exact, or delicate our instruments may be, they are still perceived by these senses and interpreted by that brain. However useful, spectacular, or necessary our ideas and experiments may be, they still have nothing to do with absolute truth or authority. Such a thing can only exist for the individual according to his whim or fancy, or his inner perception of his own truth and being. The witches and devils of the Middle Ages were real by her own standards. All reputable and respectable persons believed in them. They were seen, their efforts observed, and they perfectly accounted for a large body of otherwise inexplicable phenomena. Their existence was accepted without question by the majority of men, great and humble, and from this majority there was not, and still is not, any appeal. Yet we do not believe in these things today. We believe in other things, similarly explaining the same phenomena. Tomorrow, we will believe in still other things. We believe, but we do not know. All our deductions, for example, the theories of gravitation, are based on observed statistics. Excuse me. 
All our deductions, for example, the theories of gravitation, are based on observed statistics, on tendencies observed to occur in a certain way. But even if our observations are correct, we do not know why these things happen, or if they have always done so, or that they will continue to do so. All our theories are only assumptions, however reasonable they may seem. There is a sort of truth based on experience. We know that we feel hot or hungry or in love, but these feelings cannot by any means be conveyed to anyone who has not experienced them. We can describe them in terms of other things familiar to him. We can analyze their cause and effect according to mutually acceptable theories, but he will not have the vaguest idea of what the feeling is like. These may be very negative considerations, but within their limits we can deduce very positive principles. Whatever the universe is, we are either all or part of it by virtue of our consciousness, but we do not know which. 2. No philosophy, theory, religion, or system of thought can be absolute and infallible. They are relative only. One man's opinion is just as good as another's. There is, thirdly, no absolute justification for emphasizing one individual theory or way of life over another. Fourth, every man has the right to his own opinion and his own way of life. There is no system of human thought which can successfully refute this thesis. That much for positivism, but other things remain. There are necessity, expediency, and convenience. If these are illusions, they are still very popular illusions, and it is usual to consider them. Politics is concerned with necessity and expediency, whereas science is concerned with convenience. This is not, however, intended to discredit science and reason in their proper spheres. Reason is one of our greatest gifts, the power that differentiates us from the animals. And science is our greatest tool and our best hope for building a genuine civilization. It is curious that this modern truism appears in this system of reasoning. But in spite of its inestimable value, science is a tool and has nothing to do with ultimate truth. Herein is the danger of science. It is so valuable, so useful, and so irresistible that we incline to regard it as the arbiter of the absolute giving final and irrefutable pronouncement of all things. This is exactly the position the pedant, the dogmatist, and the dialectical materialist would have us take. Then, posing as a scientist, or propounding so-called scientific doctrine, he can persuade us to accept his values and obey his orders. Today must forever be free to overthrow its yesterday. Otherwise, it will degenerate into ancestor worship. But it is necessary that we defend freedom unless we all wish to be slaves. It is expedient that we achieve brotherhood unless we desire destruction. And it is convenient that we grant others the right to their own opinions and lives in order to maintain our own. The intelligent individual will not base his conduct on an arbitrary or absolute con or absolute concept of right and wrong. It may be argued that all motives and all actions are selfish, since they are intended to satisfy some requirement of the ego. Perhaps this is true of self-sacrifice, abnegation, and the highest altruism. We engage in those things in order to satisfy ourselves to attain some object. The ego may be very broad. A man may include the whole world as a part of his ego and set out to redeem or save this world.
but it is necessary that we defend freedom. Unless we all wish to be slaves, it is expedient that we achieve brotherhood unless we desire destruction, and it is convenient that we grant others the right to their own opinions and lives in order to maintain our own. The intelligent individual will not base his conduct on an arbitrary or absolute concept of right and wrong. It may be argued that all motives and all actions are selfish, since they, in, since they are intended to satisfy some requirement of the ego. A man may include the whole world as a part of his ego, and set out to redeem or stay in order to satisfy ourselves to attain some object. The ego may be very broad. A man may include the whole world as a part of his ego, and set out to redeem or save the world for no other reason than his own gain pleasure from this idea. Such a man, far from being unselfish, is extremely egotistical. Even the artist, devoted to the production of pure beauty, is so because of his need and his nature. At least such egotism is not petty. The motives of family, love, and patriotism are all rooted in biology. This does not necessarily detract from such actions and motives. Everything in nature is beautiful, and it is no less beautiful because it is understood. But the stupid man will assign arbitrary values to all things in order to protect and justify his own position. His morals are based on things which he wishes were true or wish, or which someone else wishes were true. His philosophy pays no attention to relative facts or realities, but in his life he must deal with relative facts and realities, and consequently he is constantly involved with pretenses and evasions. The enlightened liberal needs no such justification. He will realize and accept his inherent selfishness and the inherent selfishness of all men. He will understand living as technique, the technique of getting what he wants on the terms he wants. Stealing may be the most direct means of acquiring property, but unless he steals a considerable amount, a prison sentence is a possible co corollary corollary of his action. On the other hand, he may observe with dismay the subtle disintegration of character attendant upon the so-called legitimate business life. His problem, then, is not only to acquire the things he needs, but to get them in some entertaining or at least non-devastating manner. Perhaps he will decide it is not worth the effort, but in all problems there is no question of right involved. There is only the question of technique and of cost. Such is the case with freedom. If we ab abrogate another's freedom to gain our ends, our own freedom is therefore jeopardized. That is the cost. If we wish to secure our own freedom, we must assure all men's freedom. That is the technique. If a liberal were to develop two personalities and those two personalities and one of those personalities developed a benevolent dictatorship while the other continued his liberal activities, it would only be a matter of time until he killed himself. The restriction of others' freedom is self-enslavement and suicide. The dictator is the most abject of slaves. The single, these single considerations are the logistic basis of the philosophy of liberalism. From such considerations, and from many more, the fundamental principles of liberalism arise as a code of rights basic in nature and clear beyond misconception. This code must be the law and above the law an ultimate expression of the dignity and inviolability of the individual. It must be above the meddling of courts and lawyers, beyond the whim of the populace and the treachery of demagogues and dictators. It must be the epitome of men's aspirations towards liberty and self-determination, so sacred that its violation by a state, group, or individual is treason and sacrilege. The Bill of Rights in the American Constitution is a step in this direction, and its study will indicate a more final development. But in a world so threatened by positivism and pat paternalism, this document is limited both in scope and application. It permits such violations of liberty as the late national prohibition law, the draft law, the closed shop, 
the Mann Act, censorship laws and anti-firearm laws, and racial discrimination. It has been said, with justification, that the Constitution means what the Supreme Court says it means. A document so fundamental as a Bill of Rights cannot be jeopardized by arbitrary interpretations. It should need no interpretations. Official, group, and individual within the state. Right? It should need no interpretations. It must apply equally to the state and to every state, municipality, official, group, and individual within the state. It must apply in such a way that the individual or minority need not recourse to elaborate lengthy and costly proceedings in order to protect these rights. It is the duty of the state to provide this recourse to all alike in the manner and to better purpose than life and property are now protected from the more obvious and poorly organized forms of violence. Freedom cannot be subject to arbitrary interpretations and misinterpretations. It must plainly include misinterpretation. It must plainly include freedom from persecution on moral, political, economic, racial, social, or religious grounds. No man, no group, and no nation has the right to any man's individual freedom. No matter how pure the motive, how great the emergency, how high the principle, such action is nothing but tyranny. It is never justified. The question is, are we able to face the consequences of democracy? Nor is it sufficient that freedom be assured by purely negative means. Freedom is meaningless when its expression is controlled by powerful groups such as the press, the radio, the motion pictures, churches, politicians, and capitalists. Freedom must be ensured, and it can only be ensured by the allegiance to the principle that man has certain inalienable rights, among which are these rights. To live his private life in so far as it concerns only himself that he sees fit, to eat and drink, to dress, live, and travel as, where, and how he will, to express himself in as he sees fit, to speak, write, print, experiment, and otherwise create as he will, to work as he chooses, when he chooses, and where he chooses, at a reasonable and commiserated price, to purchase his food, shelter, medical and social needs, and all other services and commodities necessary to his existence and self-expression at a reasonable and commensurate price. To a decent environment and upbringing during his childhood until he reaches a responsible majority. To love as he sees fit, where, how, and with whom he chooses in accordance only with the desires of himself and his partner. To the positive opportunity to enjoy these rights as he sees fit without obstruction on the one hand or compulsion on the other. Protect his person, his property, and his rights to the extent of killing the aggressor if necessary. This is the purpose of the right to keep and bear arms. These rights must be counterbalanced by certain responsibilities. The liberal accepting them must guarantee these rights in, to all others at all times, regardless of his personal feelings or interests. A pillar of blood becoming become a rising pin star of light fate says you will not be on that ship and i want you to consider your emotions in that moment as it is fast approaching you will die here we are primed to enter into the age of science witchcraft, and the pyre is snacked with accelerants. The event, as the billionaires have dubbed it, is not dislocated into the future, but engulfs us in the present, like the furious clouds of the ignition sequence. The event is not a single occurrence, but a convergence of inescapable ills. Our possible futures are brutally terminated 
and it is the youth and the poor who feel it first. The profit motive does not provide for the fundamental needs of people or planet. It inequally. It multiplies inequality. I address my writing to the final generations, the last of us, as we are the critical actors on the cosmic stage. Loaded down with debt and astrological concerns, we are awakening to the signs of the end times. Ours is a generation that will never have Alkion days, whilst the undead, grown hideous on the entitlement of oil, have their young blood facials and stem cell shots as they wait for the upload. Without job, house, pension, retirement, savings, or security, the youth know that they are here to go. There is only one direction left to go, off-world. We follow the examples of the saints who stepped out dressed as clumsy astronauts onto an empty stage and perform their dumb theater with star-splashed flag and errant shadows who witness the miracle of first Earthrise. We are on a continuum, from the etched bone disks of the Neolithic through the great stone observatories of megalithic sculpture to the astrolabs and then orbital telescopes scrying across the spectrum of light. We are the makers of dugouts, drum-tight coracles, Clipper ships, gliders, black powder rockets, and hypersonic missiles. All of these advances have their spiritual components, from the dreams they emerged out of to the charm songs, dances, and rituals of voyaging and return. Here's the work to be undertaken, creating the rites that pass us through mourning and onto the fiercest path that roars through the universe. There is a ritual sequence, a prayer for every launch. Eel Pan! If knowledge came to us from the vast ocean of space, then it, is, then it is to space that we are fated to return. Our erotic foundation myth, the fall of the rebel angels, has unwritten sequels which are needed with much urgency. Science fiction has pursued that cosmic vision, whilst the occult has suppressed this critical need. The engram must be clear. It has been a long time since Milton set down his pen. After the fall, we can either sit dazed in the wreckage or plot our ascent. Something terrible is coming. We all feel it now. I do not say that we must hope, but that we must dare. A neglected virtue of that much brutalized sphinx of Eliphas Levy. Our future is one of risk and instability and will require a new pact. The stakes remain the same. We will prevail together or be utterly destroyed. Liberty, egality, fraternity. Oh, la mort. The secret truth is that we exist in relationship, and the whisper says that ours is a conspiracy of equals that has both persisted and transformed down the centuries. The rites are simple to perform. The stories endlessly retold. The pact sworn on our earth fast stone as it prays its way ceaselessly around the sun. We are required to be cognizant of the past if we are to extract a future from a malaise of cynicism and despair. Popular culture is a memory hole, capturing our lives with a stream of disconnected messages. Yet, if we dare to look, we can see the vectors extend into a future from which most avert their eyes. Only fear prevents us. There, is, there in the heavens is the legacy of John Whiteside Jack Parsons and the science witchcraft that carried us to the moon. We sang the first cradle song. Now we sing only the lament. Modern America has always read witchcraft by the light of its guttering old world satellites. Have you wondered how we see you from Albion's ancient druid rocky shore? The America we dreamt of now dreams of us. The past answers the question of where we come from by leading us into the dark wood, the devil's wood of the imaginary. But here in old Europe, in the dwindling copse, we are perhaps freer to imagine futures. And you, America, were once our future. America, where we placed our shining hopes, now fears the conclusion of that long passage to the West. How are we to achieve escape velocity from the gravity well of despair? 
the forbidden and the excluded, is where we turn when the blood-dimmed tide is loosed. To consider rejected knowledge is not to reject knowledge. To critique materialist science is not to reject science. We are not people of the book, but of the library, the sum of all knowledge and heretical discourse. All of us are the offspring of cosmic miscegenation. We are a kindred of hybridity and fluidity, scrying our reflection in the mirror of space. Before space went dark, it was a cult, the temple basal black. Our dreaming bodies, lighter than a gram, will ascend, turning fairy circles. Whilst all that is needed in that last steel needle is a single sacred drop of holographic blood for the body, for the bodily resurrection of life in the heavens. The pact sworn on our earth, fast stone as it prays its way ceaselessly around the sun. turning fairy circles, whilst all that is needed in that last steel lake. This is, this is her holy book. This is so much of what he said in that chapter. I am seeing that as I always knew, though as I always knew, Sermons and his cleverness is always a cake. I feel so sick. Seen like a cat seems right. Organic. Get rode. <laughs> oh,
Yeah. <laughs> 